Hi, my name is Wang Zeyu. You can call me Zach, which is supposed to be the pronunciation of my name in Middle Chinese a thousand years ago. I'm a second-year PhD student in the Computer Graphics Group at Yale University. In this CES50 seminar, instead of a hands-on tutorial for some programming tools, I'd like to present the idea of combining computer science with humanities. The title is. 3D world, augmented reality, and cultural heritage. First, imagine that you are visiting the Louvre Museum and see the sculpture of Venus. As appreciating the great work of ancient Greek, you must be wondering that what she is doing with her arms. Although it is the loss of her two arms that makes the sculpture famous and leaves people with infinite imagination. What about those sculptures who lost heads, or whose nose was cut off because of natural or human damage? Do you still think that's the beauty of the fact? Then what can we do to help every visitor gain access to the original beauty of these great works? Here comes our Longman story. <laughs> November eleventh. The Longmen Grottoes are located in the central Chinese city of Luoyang, the earliest and longest surviving capital of ancient China. The grottoes are situated on the southern outskirts of Luoyang, carved into the eastern and western mountains flanking the Yi River. Along this nearly half-mile stretch of the river, the grottoes spread like glittering stars across emerald mountains. And Asia waters. There are over 2,400 Buddha niches, more than 10,000 sculptures, and 2,800 carved inscriptions. In 1961, Longmen was recognized by the Chinese government as one of the most important sites for cultural preservation. Nearly 40 years later. The Longmen Grottoes celebrated the new millennium by becoming a UNESCO World Heritage Site in November of the year 2000. The UNESCO World Heritage Committee recognizes sculptures of the Longmen Grottoes as the apex of Chinese stone carving from the end of the Northern Wei Dynasty 
through the Tang Dynasty. 2,000 years ago, as the Buddhism traveled far and wide across Asia along the dusty paths of the old Silk Roads, its tradition of cave temples, architecture, and sculpture also made their way into the central plains of China. Along the Silk Road lie four great Buddhist sites in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Mo Gao Caves in Dunhuang, Mai Ji Shan Grottoes in Tian Shui, Yun Gang Grottoes in Da Tong, and Longmen Grottoes in Luoyang. Buddhism gained popularity in China during 4th to 6th century CE. The imperial and aristocratic families sought peace and prosperity for the nation through religion. Seeking to gain merit and spread the Buddhist message, these individuals initiated a tide of grotto carving throughout China. To learn more about today's main site, let's go back to the Northern Wei Dynasty around 470 CE. Founded by ethnic minorities in ancient China, in order to consolidate the central governance, their emperor, named Xiao Wen, decided to implement reforms to adapt themselves into the dominant ethnic group named Han. These reforms included building the Buddhist temples and sculptures and moving the capital from the northern city of Pingcheng to the central city of Luoyang, aiming at strengthening people's cultural affiliation to their governance. Two Buddhist architectures that we mentioned just now, Yungang Grottoes and Longmen Grottoes, were built in this period. Countless craftsmen began carving out these grottoes. Yungang grottoes were built before the Longmen grottoes. As you can see from these pictures, the Yungang sculptures looked like more of the Indian style. As you might know that ancient India was the origin of Buddhism. Yet the central Binyang cave, as an early example of the Longmen grottoes, gradually took on the characteristics of everyday Chinese society. From the kind and gentle expressions of the Buddhas to the clothing and jewelry of attendant figures. The style at Longmen became a true reflection of Chinese culture of that period. We call this process Sinicization. When it came to the Tang Dynasty, about 200 years later, Buddhism became even more popular in China. The rulers at that time kept building more Buddhist sculptures in Longmen grottoes. As you can see from the picture, the monumental sculpture of the Great Varoshana Cave stands as a remarkable testament to the only female emperor in all of Chinese history. Wu Zetian, as a devout Buddhist, had the great Varoshana Buddha carved in the middle of the western mountains at Longmen. Standing over 55 feet tall, the great Varoshana Buddha embodies the four-figured beauty of the famous Hai Tang style. With the kind and merciful bearing, the great Varoshana Buddha, as well as many other Buddhist sculptures, have been sitting in these grottoes watching dynasties rise and fall. But this tranquility and peacefulness of the grottoes and the ancient country was broken down by the first Opium War in the year of 1840, with British colonialists breaking into the door of Qing Dynasty and invaded into the land. This was just the start of China's trying modern history. Just 20 years later, the outbreak of the Second Opium War had made the situation even worse. A united army from Britain and France intruded into the old summer palace and snatched uncountable treasures, living with ashes of the inferno. French poet 
Victor Hugo marked in a letter to protest the, appearance, the disappearance of the wonder, quote, we Europeans are the civilized ones, and for us, the Chinese are the barbarians. This is what civilization has done to barbarism. From then on, especially during the beginning of the 20th century, numerous colonialists and collectors came to China and colluded with local bandits and antique stealers to smuggle Chinese art pieces to overseas collections. When they couldn't move the whole sculpture, they cut up the heads. When they couldn't remove reliefs on the wall, they scratched them off and broke them into pieces. During the warfare, due to the lack of guard and protection, these caves often became the target of political and religious retribution. These masterpieces of art, alongside with common people, became victims of war. The situation didn't end until the Second World War was over, during when numerous art pieces, including Buddhist sculptures in Longmen, were lost, sold, or destroyed. So was civilization of humankind of that period. Come back to the 21st century, these missing relics are scattered all over the world. Most of the missing Buddha heads and sculptures are part of museum or private collections in Japan and the United States. For example, two of the four missing bodhisattva heads in the central Binyang cave are being exhibited in Tokyo National Museum and Osaka City Museum of Fine Arts. The removal of the emperor and empress processions from the same cave is perhaps the greatest loss to the sculptural programs at Longmen. A unique achievement in the history of Chinese art, they remained the oldest surviving images of a Chinese emperor and empress that in inspired an entire artistic tradition. In the early 20th century, they were torn down, broken into pieces, and shipped to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City and the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art in Kansas City. The Chinese government is trying to figure out ways to take these missing parts home and show the world how these sculptures originally looked like. The delegate negotiation process is so much harder than imagination. Remarkably, in 2001, the Canadian government graciously agreed to return a looted sculpture of the Buddhist disciple Kashapa that was illegally sold at auction in 1970 to the National Gallery of Canada. This is a token of respect between two nations. However, for many other missing relics, the nature of ownership still remains challenging, and diplomatic negotiation might take decades with no guaranteed results. Fortunately, the development of technology gives us an opportunity to resolve many of the, these diplomatic and sensitive issues. In particular, 3D technology has been applied thoroughly at Longmen. Its applications include 3D scanning, model processing, 3D database, archaeological drawing, digital restoration, and virtual reality augmented reality display. Before we dive into these applications, let's consider that you just took a picture of the great Buddha using your smartphone. You get a 2D image, which means you know the x, y coordinates of the Buddha and the scene. But what if we also want the depth information, that is, z coordinates? 
it appears that recovering 3D information is very hard for a single camera. But luckily, we as humans have two eyes. What does that mean? Here comes the concept of stereo vision. If there are two cameras capturing the same scene, a 3D point will be projected on two image planes. Given the camera parameters and the pixel location of the projected point, and its corresponding point on another image plane, we can triangulate the 3D coordinates on the original object. Triangulation of 3D coordinates is just an application of trigonometry, just like how we estimate the height of a building using the length of its shadow in the physics class. More advanced 3D techniques, such as structure from motion and photogrammetry, are also based on the idea of stereo vision. However, finding correspondences is a major problem and involves many aspects in image processing. It is often hard for us to figure out which pixel in picture 1 corresponds to a given pixel in picture 2. Many image feature extraction algorithms are useful, but their accuracy and efficiency are not always the best. To make it simpler, we can substitute one of the two cameras with a projector. Laser scanners project lasers to the object to be scanned. Using the same idea of triangulation, the camera captures an object with lasers on its surface so that it becomes easier to find correspondences. Laser scanners work conveniently if there is a 3D object that is close to you. Similarly, scanners based on structured light also use a projector and a camera, but it projects a series of black and white stripes instead of lasers. These time-variant patterns make it possible to find correspondences and triangulate 3D coordinates more accurately. In addition to laser scanners and structured light scanners, time-of-flight scanners are also very useful. It uses the time difference between when the signal is emitted and received to calculate the distance from the object. Therefore, if precision isn't your first priority in scanning, time-of-flight scanners work better for large scenes to which it is hard to project lights. These scanners capture a 3D point cloud as output. To make a 3D model, we need to do some processing on the point cloud, such as aligning scans, removing noisy 3D points, polygonize the point cloud to get a mesh model, where 3D surfaces are represented as triangles, also filling the holes and smoothing. After we get the geometric model, we need to capture some pictures parameterize the model in UV coordinates and map high-resolution photos onto it to get a textured model. Most of these are core materials in a computer graphics course, and you may learn more as your study continues. You can take a look at this video to get a better sense of how people work with scanners. The projector projects a series of structured lights as the camera captures images. In this way, we can obtain a point cloud that carries both color and geometric information. By doing the same thing from another view, we can get another partial scan. Using some registration algorithms, we can align all of the partial scans to produce a complete 3D model.
Here are some other scanned models using similar technologies. The 3D digitization of Longmen started from 2005 when Longmen began to cooperate with researchers at Peking University. A multi-resolution 3D scanning framework that involves all these three types of scanners has been applied to the Longmen grottos. As you can see, that the scale of these Buddhist sculptures varies a lot from the one that is almost 20 meters high to many niches that are even smaller than our hands. We used time-of-flight scanners to scan large-scale scenes, including the Feng Xian Temple, where the Great Varoshana Buddha sits. Structured light scanners were used to scan sculptures with higher precision, and more convenient scanning could be achieved using handheld laser scanners. 3D scans using different methods can be aligned automatically using algorithms. Once we understand the 3D digitization pipeline, we can use different 3D techniques to scan caves, niches, sculptures, and inscriptions at Longmen grottos. As a matter of fact, researchers have finished 90% of the 3D digitization at Longmen from 2005 when it first started. Given the large number of relics on site, it remains very necessary to build a database to effectively organize the 3D textured models after we capture them. Researchers have built a system to manage, browse, and retrieve digital data of Longmen which interactively incorporates high-resolution photos, 3D models, and text annotations. Using a tree-structured file system, it is possible to effectively manage large-scale scenes as well as details of a particular sculpture. The system also enables researchers to perform other operations such as distance measurement. For another tool that uses the same idea but has many other functionalities, please refer to the open source Cherub software developed by Yale Graphics Group. 3D models also provide valuable information for archaeological drawing. It is an important task for archaeologists to depict shapes and structures of the heritage remains accurately. Archaeological drawing is a traditional way to record geometric shapes of the heritage remains using concise lines and curves. As one of the central components in a typical archaeological report, line drawings are time-consuming and have low accuracy using traditional methods. Instead of setting baselines, putting grids, and drawing lines manually, it is possible to automatically extract lines such as silhouettes, ridges, and valleys from scanned 3D models. Then, the 3D model and lines can be rendered to obtain the corresponding parallel projection map at a specific viewpoint. With the parallel projection maps, archaeologists can finish the line drawing with a smaller amount of post-processing work. Digital restoration is another application of significant values. Since there are many relics missing or in overseas collections, physical restoration is extremely difficult. However, in the digital world, it is possible to put together three, 2D pictures of reliefs and align them with surroundings, if that is sufficient, in representing the artwork. More interestingly, we can also restore the 3D information of relics based on models and old photos. For example, if researchers have per the permission to scan a missing Buddha head, the scanned model of the head can be aligned with the model of its remaining body.
the gap between two parts can be filled using some algorithms of geometric analysis. Here is another example from a niche. The Buddha lost its head, and we can digitally restore it in a similar way. For this model, without its nose, researchers can simply build a 3D model according to the expected shape of nose. For other missing Buddha heads that don't have any available 3D data, we can use some old photos from when the hat was not yet removed. It is easier to build a 3D model if we have photos from multiple views, but even one picture can convey the idea of its shape. Given the standard hat model as prior, we can warp it a little bit according to features detected in the old photo, so that we can produce an approximate 3D model of missing hats. For more details, please refer to our paper published in 2016. Last but not least, the development of virtual reality and augmented reality display brings a new perspective of visitor accessibility to the ancient caves. Nowadays, for better protection of cultural relics, tourists are limited to enter most of the caves. It is a great pity that they cannot appreciate these art treasures in detail. Luckily, based on all the 3D models that we have captured, it is possible to build a virtual 3D scene using specialized rendering software. Smartphones and other VR devices are capable of recovering users' motion and update the virtual viewpoint in accordance with actual motion. Three degrees of freedom in terms of rotation can be recovered using the inertial measurement unit in smartphones. We can also use a motion capture system to better localize the user so that the user can have a translation updated view when walking in a room. Moreover, we can implement an augmented reality system using digitally restored models and adding more interactive enhancing effects. The left picture shows possible appearance of wall painting in the central Binyang cave before weathering. The middle one shows the digitally restored empress procession on the wall in the same cave. The right one shows the restored model of a missing bodhisattva head using our framework based on old photos. The VR AR display of cultural heritage can effectively solve the contradiction between the protection of cultural relics and tourism promotion. Another VR display system of one for a cave was produced this year. As the first virtual reality project of Lomen Grottos, one for a cave VR can not only provide cave interior roaming, but also have cave lighting and teleportation of user position. The audience can enjoy every detail in the cave closely, and the statues can be seen from a viewpoint which is difficult to reach in reality. We talk about many applications of 3D digitization technology at Longmen Grottos. In fact, as an active research field, digital cultural heritage attracts thousands of researchers around the world. For example, a team from Stanford and other institutions initiated the Digital Michelangelo project in 1998 and produced a detailed 3D model of Michelangelo's David using laser scanners. Our CES50 instructor, Professor Benedict Brown, also worked on improving the project during his PhD study. In 2003, 
Researchers from the University of Tokyo scanned the Bayon Temple in Cambodia using different kinds of scanners, including ones on a floating balloon. In this way, after handling the drifting, they managed to have a better scan of the top before drones were commercialized. In 2009, another team from the University of Washington finished a project called Build Rome in a Day, where they reconstructed a 3D model of Rome using millions of tourist photos on Flickr instead of any 3D scanners. Fascinated we are by this wonderful achievement, other heritage sites may still face a tragic fate, even today. In 2015, ISIS demolished the Temple of the Baal Shemin during the Syrian Civil War. As a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Temple of Baal Shemin was built approximately 2,000 years ago, representing a fusion of ancient Syrian and Roman architectural styles. After the temple's destruction, the Institute for Digital Archaeology announced plans to establish a digital record of other threatened sites and artifacts. But it was such a great loss to all human civilizations that people can never make up to. This SAS 50 seminar might be very different from other ones, but I just wanted to show you how beautifully technology can interact with humanities. When I was in high school, my teacher always asked me what kind of person I wanted to be before the science class. Technology might give more power to evil if the practitioners don't use it in a proper way. That's why it is important for all of us to be aware that technology might be a double-edged sword. We'd better learn and use it critically because we're the ones to create the future. I'm so proud to be part of the Digital Long Men project when I was in Peking University under the guidance of Professor Zha Hongbin, Professor Ikao Katsuchi, Dr. Li Renju, Jin Xiaohan, Fletcher Coleman, and other scholars from the Long Men Research Academy. It is just a perfect sample of showing how the development of computer science can temporarily set aside the historical controversy of ownership empower researchers to better understand and safeguard the values of cultural heritage, and give access to everyone so that we can appreciate these artistic masterpieces in a way that people could never have imagined. From 3D scanning and geometric processing to rendering and VR AR display, technologies in computer science, or more specifically, computer graphics and computer vision, become even more meaningful and energetic for the reunion of human civilizations. Students who are taking CES50 come from different backgrounds, and those at Yale and Harvard also have the privilege of access to a liberal arts education. It is our responsibility to work hard and creatively to overcome big challenges in today's society. Therefore, I encourage you to keep the solicitude for humanity as you climb towards the top of science and technology. I would also like to encourage you to apply what you have learned in CES50 to your own areas and interests. I hope this seminar can bring you a new way of thinking, analyzing, and solving problems, thus inspire you to take advantage of the power of computer science and technology to make the world a better place for all generations to come. Thank you. If you are interested in more details, please feel free to send me an email via zeyu.wang at yale.edu to discuss more. For Yalis, you can also contact members of Yale Graphics Group. Next master or CS50 instructor 
Professor Benedict Brown will be offering another course called Applications in the Digital Humanities. By now, you all have met the prerequisites for the course. You can also take computer graphics offered by Professor Holy Rashmeyer and consider Computing and the Arts major, directed by Professor Julie Dorsey. Here's more information about the major. Computing and the Arts is an interdepartmental major designed for students interested in integrating work in computing and one of the arts disciplines. Computing and the Arts provides students with core computer science skills that allow them to explore interesting and substantive problems in architecture, art, art history, music, or theater.